the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. So, Mark asked me to speak about uh, St. Pope Carolus today, and uh, I really don't know that I'm going to say much different than anybody else can say about him, uh, because most of what we know uh, about him actually is through his stories. You know, we have, we have a biography, um, and so I'll mention just a few kind of uh, points of, of the out, kind of the uh, timeline of his life. And then <clears throat> what I wanted to do is just maybe look at some of his virtues, some of the, the qualities of him as a, as a saint, apart from the, kind of the, the, the miraculous things that we just focus on, to get a, a good sense of his personality. Because that's what's really important, I think, in studying the lives of the saints, is that we enter into their, into their spiritual life, their, how their own spiritual life transformed them, um, and how we see that transformation through their virtues. So, uh, Saint Pope Carolus the Sixth was born in 1902 uh, with the name Azar Atta, and um, he had a desire for monastic life from a very young age, and was uh, able in 1927 to fulfill his desire and enter into the monastery of, of El Baramus, which is one of the monasteries in, El, in uh, Wadi Natrun, and. Even before that, he, he manifested uh, his desire for solitude and for a life of deep prayer and meditation um, and spent many, uh, most evenings in his room alone in prayer and so on. So he already had a de strong desire and a way of life that corresponded with his, uh, with his monastic uh, calling. Um, he was ordained a priest in 1931 and uh, after some years as a, as a monk in the monastery, he went to live in a, in a cave outside of Deir al-Baramus um, as a hermit. And after that, due to some circumstances that caused him to leave the monastery, he ended up living in an abandoned windmill, which is the famous Tahuna in uh, Old Cairo, uh, where he lived for some years. And in, in between the time that he was in the windmill, he was called to go and do some renovations and to lead the monastery of Ambasamuil in, in uh, Kalamun Mountain, where in Upper Egypt near um, Minya. And then he went back to the windmill, and then eventually the, the government forced him to leave the windmill because of uh, issues with the war and safety. So he ended up living in a few different churches in Old Cairo until he built the Church of St. Mina in Old Cairo, and he lived there for uh, really a, a great number of years until he was called to be patriarch in 1959. He, no, he chose. He found the windmill, and he got permission to go there. But after s several years, uh, he was forced out. The government forced him out because of safety issues. But, uh, but he actually, when he went to the windmill, nobody knew and he was living in, the windmill initially had no door and no roof. And if you've seen pictures of the original windmill, it's uh, uh, literally, it's just a, a, a kind of a cylinder-shaped piece of cement. Just open, no roof, and, and there is no door. And then when he used to go into town to, to pray at one of the nearby churches, the priest wanted to know who is this monk that keeps coming and leaving uh, right after communion. So he sent somebody to kind of follow him and spy on him. And then he went back and told the priest, he says, this, is, this hermit's living in this windmill and there's, there's no door, there's no roof. So the priest ordered a group of workers to go and build for him uh, a door, a roof, and to actually divide the windmill into two floors so that he could put on the second floor a small altar and pray the divine liturgy there. And what was a blessing for me during my 40 days is I was able to go and pray on that altar twice um, in the windmill. The windmill is still... I mean, now they've built almost a, a large monastic community around it, but the original windmill is still there. If you go to Egypt, you can visit it. And it's really, like, amazing when you walk into it how small it is. And you have this really steep spiral staircase just to get to the second floor. On the second floor, you have enough space for maybe the priest, one deacon, and then maybe three, four people behind the priest to stand. And then the other people are just standing along the st on the stairs or downstairs in the little... Uh, reception area, which is where he slept and ate and did, did everything else. And he's tall and big. Yeah, he's uh, taller than me by a lot, I think. Um, 
And in 1959, he was, um, actually it's interesting, he received the fewest votes among the three candidates for the patriarch, which just shows you, of course, when God has a choice, it has nothing to do with popularity or anything like that. He received the fewest votes among the three candidates. And, um, and the rest, of course, is history for 1959 to 1971. So he reposed in, in March 9th, which is this Wednesday. So uh, the fewest votes f to make the final um, list up to the, the three, and then after that, it's, a, it's an altar ballot. So the choice was God's choice by altar ballot, but before that, when they start with a list of like 12 to narrow it down to three, it's by voting. So um, he reposed in 1971, which means he was only 69 years old. He, was not, he did not live a long life. You know, when you think about what he accomplished and the number of stories we have about him, uh, his patriarchal time was, what, uh, 12 years? Compared to Pope Shenouda, which was 40? You know, so in a sh very short period of time, so many uh, stories, you know, and, 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 and of course, what, what we have available in terms of stories are still a very small percentage. You know, one of the things that, because of my own kind of love for him as a saint, when I, after I was ordained the priest, when I would find people, when I was at St. Damiana's or St. Marina's or here, any, any church that I go to, when I find somebody, any, you know, above 75, let's say, you know, years of age, I say, hmm, did you ever meet Pope Carolos? And then they say, oh, and then they start telling stories, or they, st or they, or, or they at least have one encounter, which is some sort of a beautiful encounter, whether it was something miraculous or whether it was just something about his kindness and his love, and then I would ask them, did you, did you record that story? And they would say, oh, no, no, I never recorded that story. So even all the miracles that we have, which are in the thousands, I would say are probably like 1%, 2% of what we know. You know? And, and some of what we have are unbelievable. They're really amazing. And of course, you know, we had uh, somebody who was among us, Tansimira, who uh, re reposed in October who was an example of somebody who was really close to St. Pope Carlos. You know, she knew him very well in Egypt, and uh, she had lots of stories of him when he was alive. And then we saw some of the great things that she encountered in the last couple of years of her life through his intercession. And maybe we could mention a couple of those. I always hesitate to talk about those things, but now that she's departed, uh, it's a little bit safer for us. Um, I, I, I actually don't like to talk about Pope Rose because I, the thing that bothers me the most is I always say I will never do him justice. I will never speak about him what he deserves. He is one of the greatest saints of our church in any generation. Um, and not because of the miracles, but because the more you get to know him, the more you study his life, the more you are amazed at his simplicity combined with depth, with kindness, with generosity, with self-sacrifice. Um, with patience, with, with just all of the virtues. You know, he manifested all of the virtues so beautifully. So we'll just tell some stories that kind of reflect on his virtues. Uh, he was very gentle, you know, even though a lot of people, they see his pictures and they say, oh, his picture scares me, you know, or his picture, he looks so stern. But when you talk to people who knew him, like Tan Samir, they say he was like a child. You know, he was so um, simple and he was so gentle. Of course, like any saint, there are times where they have to be assertive. But his general demeanor, the, the way he was most of the time, was that he was very, um, very meek. You know, so there's a story that when he was in old Cairo that there was an older deacon that served with him. His name was uh, Uncle Fik Fikri, Fikri. And Uncle Fikri was a bit of a stickler when it came to some of the things in the liturgy, like, you know, when the priest uh, finishes, then the deacon responds. And when the deacon responds, then the priest waits until he finishes. In other words, you don't cut each other off. Because in, in the monastery, sometimes they pray very quickly. So uh, by the time the deacon is saying, Kyrie le, and the priest is already starting his next part. And before the priest finishes, the deacons are doing their, right? It's just to help keep the, thing, the rhythm of the liturgy quick. So Uncle Fikri, he said, we're not going to have any of that. If you want me to be a deacon with you, it, this was when he was a Bunamina, uh, he told him, let's not cut each other off. So one time by accident, the Bunamina, Pokrolus, he, he started his part when Amma Fikri was still finishing. So, and Pope Rose used to pray with his eyes closed and oftentimes he used to weep in the liturgy. So then he, he finished his part and there was no response. So he opened his eyes, he found Amma Fikri left. So 
the, you know, if, where is he? He went outside, he was upset, <laughs> right? Now, most, most, if you imagine priests, bishops, they would say, what is this? Like, well, yeah, yeah, it's not something that you would expect a priest or a bishop to like, tolerate very easily. Like somebody just walks out of the liturgy, right? But what did Pope Carlos do? He had one of the deacons come and stand with a candle in front of the altar. And he went outside to him and he apologized. And he said, um, forgive me. Please come back and pray with me. You know? And, and, he, and Amma Fikri was, you know, he said, okay, but we had an agreement. <laughs> Be careful, right? So uh, look, at, look at the boldness of somebody who is, you know, a lay person and dealing with him as a saint, you know? And he tolerated it and he, with meekness and with gentleness, right? I heard this story from one of the priests in, that I met in, in, uh, in uh, Vancouver about a young man who went to the monastery on Good Friday who was, n who was a friend of, uh, of another person and the, and the, uh, the friend that came, uh, one, one of the friends was not uh, used to being at church, was not really a church person. So somehow his friend suggested, let's go to Holy Week, uh, and let's go, you know, Great Friday at St. Mina's Monastery thinking it'll be like a blessing but not realizing that Good Friday at a monastery is tough. It's tougher than the churches because they, you know, they spend so and apparently um, he's not, you know, this person was not used to fasting and uh, long services on Good Friday which they don't eat until after 7 p.m. 8 p.m. So when they went, the guy was overwhelmed by the long, the long services and everything so he kind of went out and went to the kitchen and he found where they were cooking all the food, you know, in these big halas, you know, these big pots. And so he kind of looked around, didn't see anybody, so he just started eating, right? He was hungry, kushri, food, whatever. And then all of a sudden, he hears somebody behind him, he turns around and it's Pope Krolos, right? On Good Friday, and he's eating before he's, the rest of the monks are supposed to be eating. So Pope Krolos, Pope Krolos looks at him with total kindness and total gentleness, and he says to him, my son, we're monks. We're used to fasting. We're used to the long hours. What brings you on to the monastery on a day like this? Sit down, sit down, sit down. And he, he made him sit down with his plate of food and he told them, wait, I'll be right back. So all of a sudden, Pope Krulus leaves and he comes back with a plate of fruit. And he puts the plate of fruit in front of this young man and he starts to peel the orange for him. And he says to him, eat, my son, eat. Right? Now again, look at, look at the the demeanor versus what we might expect from somebody who is breaking the fast or somebody who is you know, going against the rules of some establishment uh, or whatever it might be. Um, there's a, another story of a, a church that went on a trip to the monastery, or not to the monastery, to well, the Pope was visiting one of the cathedrals, I don't know if it was in Cairo or in Alexandria, and so many of the churches were taking buses to go and greet the, the Pope at the cathedral. And um, an older lady that went with, one, with her church, when they got to the church, she was too weak to leave the bus. And she saw the crowds, and um, she saw there's no way I'm going to be able to stand for hours to greet him. It's going to be hours just to wait in line, just to take his blessing, and she's sick and weak. So she said, I'm sorry, I have to stay on the bus. So they tried to encourage her, no, come, take, you came all the way here, take the blessing of His Holiness. She said, I can't, I'm, I, there's no, I don't have the strength. So she stayed on the bus. Now this is one church out of maybe seven, eight other churches. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people are filled, crowding around the Pope. And then one of the servants from that church, when he went to go greet the Pope, the Pope tells him, go and tell, and he names the lady, to come and that I have a seat for her next to me. So, like, his heart had such compassion that out of all of these people, his mind and his heart went to the lady sitting alone on the bus, you know? And, you know, how, how, how does one have such, such, uh, such a heart of kindness, you know, in the midst of you know, thousands of people coming to take your blessing? Um, he was not, you know, again, I'm, I'm just trying to give you a sense of how his meekness and his kindness. One time on Epiphany in 1966 in St. Mark Cathedral, they were um, doing some renovations and so there was no glass on the windows. Epiphany, it's winter, right? And so um, 
you know, people think that uh, the Pope, because he was a man of prayer, he wants to pray for six hours or seven hours. But actually, uh, during the liturgy, he kept reprimanding the deacons to, to go faster in the liturgy. And then they were wondering, why is the Pope in such a rush, you know, on, at a feast? And he's the man of prayer, right? He's the one who prays every day. And, it was, and then afterward, he told them, he says, don't you see that the people are cold? Don't you see that there's no windows? Don't you see that they're, you know, like, think about the people, you know? And so his thoughts were, again, were on the people and, 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 and the situation, you know, of, of, of their well-being. Um, his forgiveness was unbelievable, you know? There's so many stories of those who, um, who went against him, and he forgave them so easily, so quickly. You know, there was somebody... Many of these stories you've probably heard me say before in different contexts, but you know, somebody who was writing in one of the newspapers and signing his name, um, the son of Dioscorus, anonymous name. Dioscorus was one of the patriarchs of our church in the fifth century. And so he's just signed his name, son of Dioscorus, but he was very critical of the new pope. So one time in the midst of uh, the crowd of people that was greeting, this man went to go greet the new pope. And so the pope looked at him and he said, uh, we're brothers. He said to him, uh, Satan, how is that? I don't, I'm not aware that we're related in any way. He says, yes, you're the son of Dioscorus and so am I. You know, because you're the son of a patriarch and we're all sons of Dioscorus, you know. So he said to him, forgive me, Satan, I didn't mean anything by it. And immediately the Pope said, you know, there's no problem. He hugged him, he embraced him, it was over. All of these examples, you know, it's interesting that they all became later like his most devoted disciples, these ones who were critical of him in the beginning. There was another story of 12 priests in Cairo. Now imagine, the, the bishop of Alexa the bishop, the patriarch is the bishop of Cairo and Alexandria. And in those days, we're not talking about hundreds of priests. We're talking about less than that by, by a lot. So his diocese, like Ambassadion's diocese, we have 60 priests now. So the Pope's diocese is Cairo and Alexandria. So 12 of his own priests, that's like 12 of us in, in Los Angeles, Writing against Ambas Rabion. Like imagine like what that would, you know, in public, you know. So they were, they were pr distributing these pamphlets in the churches, criticizing the Pope, right? Now, why, they, why were all these people criticizing the Pope in the beginning? Because he was a bit unusual from what they expected, right? He was a monk. He's praying every day. Three in the morning he's in the church by himself doing tasbaha, the divine liturgy. Every night he's doing ashaya. That's not what they wanted from a Pope. You know, he wasn't preaching. You know, so they're like, he's just a monk. He's just a, a simple, ignorant monk. And he's not really fit to be Pope. Pope. That's how a lot of people thought of him in the beginning. And so they, even, some of his, uh, even some of the clergy were, were critical of him. So these priests used to stay up until 1.30 in the morning preparing these pamphlets that they would then send out to the different churches. So one time, of course, the machine that they were using broke. And no matter what they did, the machine, they couldn't get it fixed. So one of the priests brilliant priest, right? He has this idea, maybe this is divine intervention, maybe there's a reason why we can't fix the machine, maybe God is not pleased with what we're doing. So he went on his own to the Pope, and, um, and he said to him, Sayyidina Akhtit, I have sinned, absolve me. And the Pope asked him, what is the matter, my son? The priest responded, I insulted you so much. Uh, I insulted you so much, Your Holiness. The Pope said, yes. I know, staying up until 1.30 in the morning every day, printing pamphlets and distributing them among Alexandria to Aswan until the printer broke. Right? <laughs> Astonished, the priest said to him, you know all this? Right? And the Pope listed the names of all the 11 other priests right, who participated with him. And then he said to him, why didn't you say something to us? Why didn't you talk to us? Right? Like, why would you wait? It's like over a year that we were doing this. Why wouldn't you say something? And the Pope's answer was, I was praying for you. The priest said, I have sinned. Please absolve me, Your Holiness. The Pope answered him, now look at the beauty here. With all my heart, I absolve you, my son. Like that. Like that. He didn't say, no, no, no. You've got to do one-year penance. You have to go and write in the newspaper an apology. He said, with all of my heart, I absolve you, my son. Then the priest asked, should I bring my colleagues, the other 11? The Pope answered, why not, my son? Let them come. And the priest asked him, do you absolve them? Lest I bring them and they get chastised, right? 
And the Pope said, with all my heart, I absolve them, my son. Right? The group of priests visited him and then they remained among his most faithful children. Right? Another time, uh, one of the newspapers that was writing very accusatory things against the Pope um, was shut down by the government. And uh, so one of his disciples went to say and said, you know, Mabruk, you know, this newspaper that had been writing bad, nasty things about you, they're getting shut down. They're getting their, their just due. Right? So the Pope says to him, what are you saying, my son? The newspaper was shut down. Now that, that has 200 workers who now have families that don't have jobs. How could you be happy that that newspaper is being shut down? And then he himself, the Pope, called officials in the government to try to reinstate the newspaper, the same newspaper that was criticizing him. And when, they, when the government refused, then the Pope himself tried to find jobs for as many of those people as he could. Unbelievable. His humility was uh, supernatural. Um, one time, Abuna Rafaela of Amina, who is his still living disciple in, in Marimina Monastery, he says, one night I woke up and I heard some movements in the reception room in the middle of the night. To my great surprise, I saw His Holiness standing in the kitchen in his night clothes, putting away the dishes and the food back in the refrigerator. And the Buna Raphael was, was so moved, he says, Sayyidina, what are we here for? We are, we, we, you're a patriarch. We're your servants and your disciples and we have staff. That's our job. And his response to Abuna Raphael was, you are tired, my son, after working for me all day. I was concerned that the food would go bad because I didn't eat any of it, so I thought it would be better that I put it away. Have a good night. <laughs> Abuna Rafael says he started to weep. Another time, uh, uh, the Pope was visiting uh, the, the area called Kafr Sheikh, and uh, the streets were filled with people. They had prepared for him a huge banquet, right? As you would expect, of course, a patriarch visiting a city for the first time. They prepared for him a huge banquet with lots of food and so on. And among the people, the, the crowds of people that were running up to the Pope to take his blessing, um, the, the Pope turned to one of the very simple poor men and said to him, it seems to me that you sell falafel. You know? So the man was amazed, like how could he know that I sell falafel on the street corner? So the man uh, was, said, yes, your holiness, it's true, I do sell falafel. So the Pope said to him, I would very much like to eat from your falafel. So the man ran, so excited, to go and bring some of his falafel for the patriarch. Of course, the people, the officials and the clergy were critical. They're like, Your Holiness, they have a reception for you with, with tables. And he says, I want to make him happy. I want him to be happy. Let him, let him be happy. Another time, um, you know, a lady brought uh, the Pope in the, in the cathedral two hard-boiled eggs, you know. So he looked at them and he said, are they boiled well so they don't break in my faragay and make a mess? She said, no, your holiness, they're boiled well. So he put them in his pocket and he went to Abun Rafael. He says, Abun Rafael, look, we have dinner tonight. And he was serious. He was happy. He was excited. He says, look, God sent us dinner. The Pope is excited because a, a lady brought him two hard-boiled eggs. Though he can have whatever he wants. But he, he was joyful to take it from the, the purity of heart of this woman who, who, who made it an offering of love. Right? When Abuna Raphael was first brought into the Patriarchate, he was brought in as a disciple. So they were, they would become the Farashin, the, those who were the workers, the staff. And then he had his disciple, like Abuna Raphael. So when Abuna Raphael came into the Patriarchate and, uh, you know, somebody was commenting about the disciple of the Pope, the Pope turned to all of them and he said, no, Akhwet, brothers. I mean, the, the workers and my disciple are brothers. We don't say one is a worker and one is a disciple. You are brothers. Treat each other like brothers. There's nobody higher than the other. No. One time the late Amba Athanasius of Beni Swift, which was, who was also a very great saintly man in our generation, uh, when he was first ordained a bishop and he was giving a sermon in front of the Pope. The Pope never gave sermons, but he often listened to sermons. And sometimes they said, actually, 
he would weep from listening to the sermons of the priests or the bishops because he would apply the words to himself. So uh, it seems Ambathanasius, when he was first ordained, was a, he was a bit fiery. So he was, which unfortunately is sometimes a bit typical in our church, he was being a little tough on the people. You don't do this and you can't do this. And, right, and it was, so after he finished, the Pope went to him and he said to him, my son, why do you yell and order the people? Who knows who is better? Who knows who is the better person? You know, you are the one sitting that you're speaking to. Right? So he had this sense of poverty, the sense that not just because we're patriarchs, bishops, priests, but God is the only one who knows right? who are the true followers, who are the true believers. And so be careful, you know, he's telling him, don't put yourself above the people. The, um, this, is not a, uh, not, it's, this is not so much a Pope Carilla story, but it's, uh, if you've heard of one of the other modern saints, Abuna Felto Os, Suriani, one of the, uh, the great monastic fathers who reposed in 2007. Well, Pope Carilla sent him to help out when they, when they, did, when they built the new monastery of St. Mina. Pope Carilla needed some monks to help you know, get it running and, and to do some of the construction. So Abuna Felto Os, as one of the well-known monks from Dir Surian, he went. And so, this is in his movie, if you've seen his movie. But um, he used to um, have to take um, water um, by donkey great distances in the desert, you know, to, to, for the cement and so on. And uh, one time, um, the donkey that was pulling the cart of, of the materials got loose and, and ran off in the, in the, in the desert. So... Abuna Felta Os, this is a story about humility. So Abuna Felta Os, in his mind, he said, um, don't be upset. That because he was, you know, he lost the donkey. It's a, it's a big thing to lose a, a donkey, right? I mean, so he, he, he said to him, don't be upset. Put yourself in the place of the donkey. Abuna Felta Os said that to himself. So he himself dragged the cart back to the monastery. And as he was doing that, St. Mina appeared to one of the other monks, which could be a Buna Raphael, we don't know for sure. Uh, he doesn't say, but usually when he says another monk, he could be speaking of himself. And, and St. Mina tells uh, the monk, he says, tell Abuna Felta Os that I will not forget the fact that he put himself in the place of the donkey for me. So it's a story of humility, right? Pope Krolos and the saints like him, they had no problem to associate themselves with, with donkeys, right? St. Mina himself was grateful that Abuna felt Os put himself in the place of a donkey. I'll tell you a story about Tan Um And this is a light story. It's not one of the, the more magnificent ones, which I'm still not sure to speak about. Last year, in November, during St. Mina's Feast, uh, I received a call um, on Friday morning to go um, give a sermon at St. Mina's Church for St. Mina's Feast. And it was very last minute. So I said, uh, Abuna John Paul called me and I said, Abuna, I'm not really prepared on short, such short notice to give a talk. He said, okay, speak about Pope Krolos. So um, I said, okay, I can, I can try to, in a couple of hours, put together some, some notes on Pope Kulis. So, um, first thing I did was I called Tan Samira, and I said to her, um, uh, Tan, I need your prayers because uh, I'm going to go speak about Pope Kulis, and you, you have to, you know, she had such a strong relationship with him, I said, you know, ask him to pray for me. And... Um, so she asked me, when are you going? What time? Who's going with you? All these questions. I was kind of wondering why she's asking me so many details. Turns out she was trying to see if I was going by myself. So that uh, then she says, can I come with you? She said, be a blessing, it aunt. But it's going to be a long day because I have to go all the way to St. Mina's and then Temgid and procession and sermon and all these things. Ashaya. So um, she was so excited to go. Anyways, we went to the church, and 
I was giving the sermon, and one of the stories that I said was a story about, and I won't mention details, but it was a story about Tan Simira when she was younger, and something really bad happened to her. And she went running to, something physical happened to her by somebody that was close to her. So she went running to the Pope, that she often did in those, in, her, in those days. She was in her early 20s. She went upstairs, the Pope was there, she went upstairs and before, she, before the Pope said anything, or before she said anything, the Pope said to her, Ya Habibit Abuki, I felt every one of those blows with you. I was there with you and I took those blows with you. Somebody was hitting her. Okay. So he comforted her and consoled her, but this incident was a very painful incident in her life because it was one of many incidents that she suffered from. And I know that when she talked to me about these incidents, they brought up a lot of pain in her life. So I knew that maybe it, she might not be happy that I'm mentioning this story. I didn't mention her name, of course, and that she was sitting in, in the front with it, of the church. But I wanted to show, at the, look at the fatherhood of Pope Carlos, right? That he, his love for his children was such that when something was happening to one of his children, he felt it. And he felt the evil of it. And he took it with her, right? So that's, that's the point of the story that I was saying. Anyways, after we finished the, I finished the sermon, Abuna said there's Orban from the liturgy in the morning, pass out Lutmah Tilbarakah. So I started to, and then Tan Samir is coming, I can see she's a little bit um, anxious to leave. She's agitated. And then there's a girl behind her who is saying out loud, what's that beautiful smell? Do you smell that? Do you smell that? There's a beautiful smell in the church. What's that beautiful smell? And I can see Tan Samir trying to get away from her. Right? So... Then Tan Samira came and then I smelled this beautiful fragrance. So I, I, I asked her and I, I was familiar with this fragrance because I, I saw it happen to her before. So I asked her, what happened? She said, Abuna, please, can we go? Can we go right now? And I said, okay, Tan, but I have to finish and then say goodbye to the priests. And yeah. she said, please, Abuna, just say goodbye and let's go. So I went to the priest and I, I took my leave from them and then I went to go help her walk because she was very frail at the time. I, with my left hand I was holding her, with my right hand I was holding her purse and as I'm holding her hand, my hand is full of fragrant oil. She said, Tan, tell me what happened. So she says, I'll tell you when we get in the car. So we get to the car and then I say, okay, I'm not driving until you tell me what happened. She says, when you said that story, I found Pope Krulos next to me and he, with one hand, he held my hand and with his other arm, he put his arm around me, and he told he told me, "Mitazalish, mitazalish, mitfakarish. Don't think, don't remember these bad incidents. Let it go." Right. So even forty some years later, the same father who comforted his daughter, right, knowing that she might be upset, hearing the story, right, comes to her at that moment and comforts her. And the smell that the is, was, was that any time he touched her, right, usually it left the mark through oil or the fragrance. And this is something that many of us, we witnessed many times here at St. Paul's, right? And I am a witness to it, and many people who here are witnesses to it, that we saw with our own eyes and with our own senses that many times when Tansimira was here and she was very sick, she would be visited by, by Pope Rose who would put his cross on her or bless her and we would find the oil coming from her, from her head um, and many, many, many other stories. But I don't want to talk about just the, the miraculous part. I, I want to show you, again, the fatherhood, the kindness, right? Um, I'll tell it. I know we're, we're late and I have so many pages of stories, but I want, this is another beautiful story from somebody who was very close to the Pope. His name is Dr. Hanna Yusuf Hanna. Um, I'm just going to read it because it's so beautiful. He says, the 22nd of June is one of St. Mina's feasts, and I have always celebrated that festival. In 1967, I was arrested and put in a detention center. I did not know what would happen to me in such a place where there was torture beyond imagination, and no one could endure it except those whom God wanted to stay alive. 
For 11 days in that center, I never stopped calling out, Saint Mina, Saint Mina, I am innocent, I am innocent. I was really troubled and wondered why Saint Mina was so slow to save me. On the 21st of June, I said, when I was in America and your feast day comes, I used to fly all the way back to Egypt and go to your monastery. And now I am here, not far from the monastery, and yet I cannot take part in the festivities. What happened? Have you changed? Why have you, why have you left me? The following day, which was the 22nd of June, I was released from the center, so on that feast day. Um, I was the only one released on that day because St. Mina wanted me to go to the monastery and celebrate the feast as I always did. The next day, I went with Bishop Samuel, the late Bishop Samuel, to see Pope Carolus. I was a nervous wreck, unable to walk, and the marks of torture were evident on me. My head was shaved, and my back was mutilated from the torture. When we went before Pope Kurulus, he said to me, Are you angry with St. Mina? No, Your Holiness, I answered. He added, St. Mina said not to be upset with him. He came and asked me to tell you not to be upset with him. He said that you called him many, many times, but because there were too many sons in Sinai who wanted his help, he had to save them. However, he kept your bones unbroken and saved your life. I said to Pope Kurulus, How do you like this? And then I showed him, he uncovered his back, uh, where he showed Pope Carolus all the, the scars and the mutilation from the torture. So he says to him, how do you like this? It was so painful a scene, he says, that His Holiness began to weep. So the Pope started crying when he saw um, Dr. Hanna Yusuf's uh, back. And he was weeping so much that the, the tears were wetting his beard. He then took oil from the lamp in front of St. Mina's icon and he began to rub my back. He prayed, but I couldn't understand his words because he was crying. I could hear him crying as he was standing behind me. He kept on doing that for half an hour. Then he said, here you are. St. Mina has kept his promise. Look in the mirror. He says, I was stunned to see that the flesh which had fallen off my back had come back and filled even the crevices and all the scratches were gone. Unbelievable. Should we stop? <laughs> Another person says that they went, uh, he was an accountant from Alexandria. His name is Mr. Ahmed Thabit Bishay. He suffered from many diseases that affected him psychologically, and he was examined and treated by many doctors, but all in vain. They couldn't find, they couldn't help him. So some advised him to go see Pope Carolus, but because of his lack of faith, he was hesitant to go. But then he became desperate, so he went to the Pope when he was, at that time, was at the monastery of St. Mina in Mariut. He asked the Pope to pray for him. The Pope covered him with um, his, his vestment um, that he was wearing during the liturgy, and he prayed. But the man says that I didn't get better, like on the spot. So he turned to the Pope and said, I'm not leaving this place until I recover. The Pope looked at him with compassion and asked him to sit down on a chair and he prayed again for him. His Holiness then whispered in his ears, here is Saint Mina, he came especially for you. Mr. Amel says, I, felt in, I, I immediately felt as if electricity was going through all my body, which became very light. When the Pope finished praying, I felt that every sickness had left me. So I shouted, I recovered your Holiness, I recovered. So look at the, the power of faith there. There, there's the story I mentioned before of the, the man who uh, on a, used to go, like to go in the morning on his way to work to take the blessing of the Pope. And then this time, as he was taking the blessing of the Pope, the Pope told him, uh, wait f next to me, my son, I need you. So the, the man said, uh, okay, Sayyidina, uh, sure, no problem. So after a few minutes, the, the Pope was still greeting other people. So the man said to him, Sayyidina, I, I have work. I'm going to be late for work. To, to him, my son, I need you. So he waited 15 minutes and then the man looked at Satan and he said, Satan, I, I'm really going to be late for work. I'm already late. So the Pope looked at him and he says, everything is okay now, my son, you can go. So the man was kind of frustrated. You asked me to wait, you needed me for something and then you just dismissed me. So the man went to his work and when he was there he found a, a commotion outside of his office. People were uh, frantically uh, you know, waiting for him. And when he came, the, the people said to him, uh, why were you late today? Thank God you're late. The part of the ceiling above your desk collapsed right onto your desk, 
where you would have been sitting if you had been on time as you always were on time. No, he didn't. I mean, as far as we know, he never nominated himself. His, he, was, uh, he was pressured into allowing his name to be nominated. Like when you read his biography, there were some of his close disciples that were bishops at that time who um, insisted that his name be entered without his desire, his consent. But he, he didn't refuse once you know, when he just left it up to God's will. But he had a vision. He had a, he had a vision um, when, um, of the previous patriarch, I think it was Yuseb, the cane, the, the cane. He had a vision where he was in the windmill and then he found the Pope coming to him, the, the previous Pope, Ambi Yuseb, coming to him. And he's saying, Abu Namina, Abu Namina. So the Pope ran, runs down the hill to greet the Pope. And he says to him, Abu Namina, my, my staff, it's broken. Can you fix it for me? So the Pope, and the, it's a vision, right? So the Pope in the vision, he says, Sayyidina, I will, I will fix it for you. I'll so he runs back and he fixes it, he tapes it together and he comes back. And, he, and then the Pope says, you keep it. You keep it, and then he disappears. So the, he he wondered what that meant. So, um, so there was an interesting story. One of the priests, his name is Father Tadeus Gorgi. Um, he says that he you know he was uh, one of the secretaries in the patriarchate, and uh, you know they were trying to raise the level of the patriarch, you know, and to establish a kind of sense that the patriarchate is this dignified place. So a man and his, and his sick wife come to see the Pope. So Abuna Tadeus says, if I just let them in, they'll think that like, anybody could just come and see the Pope. So he says, no, 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 uh, you can't see the Pope. You have to take an appointment. Come back after one week. Right? So I mean, he, he's thinking that this is going to somehow raise you know, the, the dignity of the, of the place. So, um, so he says, I scheduled him to come back a week later. When the Pope saw me later that day, he said he, he looked at me deeply and he said to him, my son, the man that came to you with his sick wife, why did you put him for an appointment a week from now? So, of course, Abuna didn't tell the Pope that. He, he didn't want to tell him that. So he says to him, my son, call him immediately and have him come and bring his wife. So, and tell him that His Holiness is waiting for him. I'm not going anywhere until he comes. So the, Abuna says, I tried to disagree with the Pope. Like, I tried to tell him, like, it's okay if they come in a week. Like, what's, you know, but the Pope said, right now, right now. So the man went, uh, I mean, Abuna called the man and told him to come with his wife. And uh, they said when they came in, they found the Pope sitting on his chair and he was holding the cross in his hand. Um, and as the man, uh, the husband, started to approach the Pope, he, he fell down on his face and then he would get up and then he would take a few steps and he would fall down on his face so three times everybody's seeing that this man he's trying to walk towards the Pope to take his blessing and then he would fall down on his face three times um, so when he finally reached the Pope the man was about to say something to his holiness and the Pope said my son do not say anything after then raising the cross over his wife's head and praying his holiness told them that's all she's not sick anymore and indeed, she was healed on the spot. When they were leaving, Abuna asked the man, what was up with the three you know, times that you fell on your face? And he said to him, um, he says, when I, uh, when I saw the Pope sitting on his, on, on his chair, his eyes were emitting a light, a kind of radiant light like the sun. He says, I, I was blinded. Like every time I, I would be hit by this light, I would fall down. You know, and as I got closer, the light became brighter and brighter. And he says, I saw this three times. And then he says, you know, who can stare at the sun? So like staring at the sun, I, I, I fell down. So that's another beautiful story. Did you find out Well, out of his love. I mean, it was his love. He says, why? Somebody's coming with, with, with his wife is sick, and you're making him come back a week from now? Yeah. No, it was because of his love for his people. Um, oh, with the piesters? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the, it was the story that I put on Facebook the other day was about a young man who was living with his brother and his wife, and he started to get a sense that his brother and his wife were kind of getting sick and tired of him living there, and they started to treat him a little bit more roughly, so he left, and he hadn't eaten, and so it was getting later in the day, and he was hungry, and then he, uh, he dropped something, I think, so as he reached down to pick up what he dropped, he found, uh, uh, was it a coin of five piastres? Yeah, five piastres at that time, whatever worth more than <laughs> so he said okay with five piastres I can go buy a couple of sandwiches of fool in, in or tameya and with the two piastres I can take a, a, get a bus to and from the patriarchate and go see the Pope so when he went to the Pope the Pope when he saw him he said to him my son what's wrong with you so he said to him uh, Sayyidina it seems God has abandoned me he says no God hasn't abandoned you you're the one who forgot he says, didn't God feed you today the food and, and, and uh, sandwiches? And then he says, I remembered that I picked up that coin. So he wants to say, you know, remind him that you think that's just a coincidence, but that's God caring for you, you know? Um, so again, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see that how through the, the vision of the saints, through their knowledge of, of, of how God's will works, that they can help us to see what's hidden. They can help us to see how God works in a way that we don't see a, how it work, how it works. Um, there's another beautiful story I'll, I'll, um, that was said by Omin Irini about the unity of the church, and maybe we can end with this story. So, and it kind of involves so many different saints. It's a really beautiful story. Amba Bra'ama Fayyum, before he went to heaven, he went to Deir Abu Sufain. This was before Omin Irini by many years. But he went to Deir Abu Sufain and he, he gave them some holy oil. And he said to them, this is a very special oil. It's an oil that came to us from heaven. And he says, before I depart, I wouldn't entrust this oil with anyone else than the nuns here at Abu Sufain. So when Tamav Irini, when she became a nun there, she, she heard about this oil. And they called it Zit al I don't know how you translate that. Zit al is just like the special oil. The special oil. And, they, and this oil, Ambabram told them, will be, you use it if any of the nuns are sick. You, you, they can anoint themselves. And it's a, it's a heavenly oil. So it became a practice in the monastery. This is what Omin Irini is saying. It became a practice in the monastery that anytime there was a miraculous uh, oil coming from like uh, the icon of Abu Sufain or from his relics, they would add that oil to this oil. So it was always being replenished. There was always you know, this, this source of miraculous oil. And they called it Zit al the special oil. So, uh, so the story is this, and uh, I don't have a picture of the bishop, but it's, it's beautiful. So in, in Birmingham, England, there was uh, our Coptic bishop, his name is Amba Misail, he's still there. And there was a Greek Orthodox bishop who has since reposed, his name was uh, Bishop Irenaeus, Greek Orthodox. And you know the Coptic and the Greek Orthodox are not in communion, right? fully in communion. But somehow Amba Misail and Bishop Irenaeus, they became friends. Bishop Irenaeus began to know more about the Coptic Church. And he began to de develop a great love for the Coptic Church. And he, he desired unity. Like he was very sad that the Greeks and the Copts were not in communion with each other. And so he often prayed with tears for the unity of the church. So one time he was praying. Now, this is really an unbelievable story. He was praying in, in England, right? And as he was praying... Pope Carolus and a child next to him appears to him. And he tells him, my son, we are, very, we are very happy that you are praying for the unity of the church. And we also are praying for the unity of the church. Right? Which shows us something beautiful, right? That the saints are, are praying for this, right? And we also are praying for the unity of the church. And he says, my son, I need you to do something for me. I need you to, to take this oil and to go to Egypt, to the, to the nunnery of St. Uh, Mercurius Abu Sufin, and there you will find my spiritual daughter, Irini, and I want you to give her a message. I want you to tell her that she is going to suffer much, but that we are with her, and we are praying for her. And I want you to give her this oil, and she will know what to do with it, right? to add to the Zit al -Hoa. And then so Bishop Irenaeus asked him, who is the child? He says, that's the martyr, the great, the great child martyr, St. Abunub. Why he appeared with him, we don't know. But 
the two of them appeared. So in fact, then Bishop Irenaeus told Amba Misail about this um, uh, vision. And so Amba Misail took him and they went to Egypt and in front of many other bishops and priests who were witnesses, he went and visited Tamav Irini and gave her the oil and told her the, the story. It was interesting is like a year ago, I got a call from Abuna Musa al Gohari from Boston, who somehow is related in the story, I don't know exactly how, but he had heard that I had posted the story on Facebook or something, so he wanted to ask me, like, where, so I said, when it's, it's from one of the books of Tamagarini, and I didn't, I don't have any inside uh, knowledge of it, it's just from one of the books. So he said, I, I'm looking for uh, pictures or more information about the bishop because I didn't know his name. So I said, no, I have his name. And I, I sent him pictures of the bishop. You can find it online. His name was Bishop Irenaeus of Birmingham. Um, so, so Abuna Musa said, yes, I, I, I know this story. And, and, and it, it, it's something that is, you know, was one of the beautiful stories in the, in the history of the church and the, the modern history of the church. So it's just a beautiful thing to, to, to show that not only is Pope Corolla still performing so many miracles for people, but it's his personality, and this is what we hear, for, we hear from many of the saints. They say the saints, the, the people, when we, when we die, when we repose, we still maintain our personality, right? We still, like, the character is still the same character, right? So Pope Corollas, who was kind and humble and gentle and um, caring and all of these things, is still, showing himself that way. You know, he's still manifesting himself. The miracles are, are, are numerous. I mean, there's thousands of them in, 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 in so many different books. But when you read the miracles, go beyond the supernatural to the virtue. That's what we want, right? We want to absorb from him his, his life of, of sacrifice and, and kindness and gentleness and prayer his love for the liturgy, his love for the church, his love for the saints. You know, the miracles help us to see those aspects and that's, that's, that's the great gift for us. Because we can't maybe imitate him in his miracles, but we can imitate him, we can follow him in his virtues. So, I think I'll stop there because I think we would. Yes, sure. Less than 12 years ago, a Canadian who was a Copt um, who got a, a picture from, uh, for his holiness, Pope uh, Corollos, at full size, and he doesn't know how to frame it. So he gave it to a Canadian who was non Copt completely, and he asked him, You, you do woodworking? Uh, okay, I'll take it with me. <laughs> okay, so he gave it to the Canadian who was, who was a non Copt to do some woodworking frame, and and then the guy was waiting for it, and, and then he asked him, what happened to my picture? I want it back. No, 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 I'm going to tell you a story. I was one day coming back to my house in Toronto, and then I find the garage door was open, and a dark guy running out of my garage, and I stopped the car, I pulled his hand, I said, what the heck, excuse me, what, what's happening here? And then he said, to him, I was trying to steal your house, but that guy with the black dress held my hand, and said to me, don't ever come here again. <laughs> yeah. There's a, I'll tell one more story with Tan Samira. Tan Samira used to take the bus, um, the, the OC Transit, every uh, Wednesday, Friday, sun, not Sundays, usually Sundays she had rides on the weekdays to St. Marina f for the liturgy because she's, she didn't drive and she was widowed so, and her daughter worked. So, so she, she had, for years, she had the same schedule, right? The, the OC Transit, they knew her by name. She knew all the drivers for years. They know that on Wednesday, they need to pick her up at such and such a time and on Friday, such and such a time. Without, there's, it's, there's never been an issue. So one, I forget if it was a Wednesday or Friday, um, she was waiting outside. She usually stands outside with her purse, waiting for the OC Transit. They didn't come. She waited 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. So she got really upset. So she went in and she called them. And she said, where's the bus? And they said to her, oh, Mrs. Doherty, you, uh, somebody, did you, didn't you call and change 
the time to like 11. She says, why? No, I, I, of course I wouldn't do that. The liturgy is over at like 10, 30, 11. So they said to her, well, somebody changed it in the system. She said, you know me. You, you guys come to me twice a week ev for the last f seven years. I, I would never change it. They said, we're really sorry. That's what the, the, the computer said. So, I'm oh, sorry, she was calling from, from outside from their cell phone. So she got really upset. She said, no, no, forget it. Don't come because by the time you come, I will, uh, it'll be communion and, it's, and I can't go that late. So she said, she told me, Abuna, I, I was like really upset, like angry upset. So I walked into the house and uh, I went in my room to put my purse down. She said, I found Pope Carulus sitting on my bed, holding his cross. And she said to him, oh, Baba, she used to call him Baba. And, he, and she said to him, I want to go to church. <laughs> she used to get really upset, like even with him, if she couldn't, because of her illness. I want to go to church. I want to take communion. Why? Why? So he told her, "You're going to know soon." She said, "Did you change the?" He said, to her, "You're going to know soon." And as she's talking to him, right, he's sitting on her bed. As she's talking to him, the uh, one of the maintenance uh, crew who's in this in the development, we always see him when I used to go visit. Her. He's he was in a golf cart. You know, it's one of those. Crew, you know, the maintenance guys in the golf cart, they're going around, for, it's an apartment complex, so going in the different units. So as she's talking to him, this guy comes uh, in a panic to Tansimira's window. Her window was facing the, the hallway to her apartment. And he said to him, she's knocking, Mrs. Doherty, Mrs. Doherty, are you there? Mrs. Doherty, are you there? So she says to him, she knew, I forget his name, she knew him by name, she said, yes, I'm here. He said to her, you didn't go to church this morning? She said, no, the bus didn't come. He says, oh my God, thank God, the bus just a few minutes ago down the street was in a very bad accident in the intersection, right below her, right where her, at the bottom of her street. And so then she looks at Pope Krulis who's holding the cross and smiling at her, you know. So this is another story that she witnessed. He just changed the system somehow. I don't think he had to make a phone call. They, they get things done. They get things done very, uh, very easily. Yeah. Uh, do you know the story how she first met him? Yeah, can I tell that real quick? So she was in her early 20s and she was a school teacher. So she, um, she was out of work. So she, she was told, you know, people told her, go to the patriarch, he's a very holy man, ask him to pray for you. She had never met him, she'd never had any encounter with him before. So she went and, and she attended the service. I think it was the morning liturgy. And then afterwards, you know, after he passed out Lomat al Baraka, then in the reception area, the crowds of people, they all want to take a blessing from him. So if you remember Tan Samira, she's she comes up to my waist, right? <laughs> Very short woman. So she said, like Zacchaeus, like, you know, she, she's behind this crowd of people. She can't even get close to him. She can't even see him. So she thought to herself, maybe it's, maybe it's not really worth it. And right as she's kind of thinking that in her mind, she says she finds the, the crowd of people, half of them moving over to the right and half moving to the left. And then until all of a sudden she finds like a straight line between her and the Pope, and the Pope is doing this. <laughs> like that. So then the Pope says to her, Dali Habib Tabuk. So the lady next to Tansimira thought he was talking to her. So she's like, Ana Sayyidna? <laughs> means duckling. You know? In other words, not you, the short one, right? So he says, <laughs> So she said she was like, her heart was pounding, she was very nervous. So she went to him, and then he said he left everybody. He took me by the hand, and she said he had a strong grip, and with his stick, he had a very strong walk. So she said he grabbed me by the hand, and he walked off to like a, a sitting area. And then he said, you know, told her to sit next to him. And then he told her, Habib Tabuki, Bukra, tomorrow, you're going to have a, a very important phone call. Make sure you're home to answer the phone. So she says, Tabsaidna, like, let me speak. He says, I know everything. Tomorrow, make sure you're home and you answer the phone. You have an important phone call coming. So she was, this is her first encounter. She's a bit frustrated. She's like, oh, let me say something. Let me tell you why I'm coming. Like, don't just send me off saying you're going to pray for me, you know? So, anyway, she went home, and then the next day she gets a phone call from a school that she never applied to. 
right? So they tell her, um, you know, we have a class that we would love for you to come and take a look at, and if you're happy with it, we'd like for you to start. So she gathered her resumes and portfolio and all this stuff, and she went to the school wondering, like, why did they call her? And then, um, you know, they're immediately they're trying to sell her on this position. So she says to them, okay, well, I brought you my, my, my file, and, they, and the, the, the principal says, uh, well, we have everything, we have everything. She says, what do you mean you have everything? She says, he says, don't you have like somebody who's like a general in your family? Came by yesterday and he brought us your, your, he brought us your, your file. So she said to him, can I see it? <laughs> so she said he took out an exact copy of what she was holding, file with exact same papers. And she was like really scared, like what's going on, right? So she, she got the job and then she went straight to go see the Pope. And then as soon as she saw him and he saw her, he started laughing and say, are you happy now? Are you happy with the book? Are you happy? And then that's how the relationship started. Since that time, she never let go of him. And she said she used to go see him at least two, three times a week for some years. It must have been St. Minas. must have been St. Minas. Glory be to God. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Lord, we thank you for all the gifts and all the blessings of this day. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of your saints that you give to be witnesses of every generation. We ask you, Lord, to bless us and all of our families and our workplaces through the prayers of the great Saint Pope Carulus and bless us with his feast in this upcoming week and bless us with these holy days of the fast of our Savior through the intercession of Saint Mary, Saint Pope Carulus, Saint Paul, and all the saints. Hear us when we pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Amen. Daily bread, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them. Lead us not in temptation. Go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you all. I have more Urban if anybody would like.